I'm very honored to have invite our first keynote speaker to the stage. Uh, her name is Rosa Maria. She uh, comes from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center in Spain. So on the other side of the continent, we're very happy that she could make it here on time. As I said, supply and logistics are not reliable, and neither are flights these days. Um, Rosa uh, has a PhD in computer science from Technical University of Catalonia. She's the manager of the workflows and distributed research, a computing research group at BSC. She is considered one of the key and outstanding researchers in parallel programming models for multi-core and distributed systems, so parallel and computer distribution. And uh, she has contributed to task-based programming models over the last 15 years. Her group focuses on different uh, parallel programming uh, uh, approaches, uh, the applications and uh, to the development of large heterogeneous workflows that combine high performance computing big data and, high, and uh, machine learning. They are also developing libraries, also for learning, not just computing. Um, it also has published over 200 papers in conferences and journals, top tier, and she has been very active in in projects funded by the European Commission and also in collaboration with industry. She has recently received the Europar, another European conference in parallelism, achievement award in 2019, and the Donatic Award in 2018 in the category Academia and Research. I'm very happy to invite the PI of the eFlows for HPC uh, project, European project, and uh, to learn more about her work there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florina. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be here in this very nice city. I already was able to see the center and the very fine. And uh, thank you for, again, for the invitation. It's really a uh, pleasure to be here in this historical place. I'm very excited. Um, so I, I will now also fix. Yeah, it works. I don't know if it points, but it definitely moves the slides. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, uh, okay. So it does, uh, the better it should be. Okay, so let's start uh, with my presentation. It's about uh, this project that uh, well, we are very excited in my team in Barcelona to lead. Uh, Always coordinating a European project is, is a challenge. No? I was reluctant to this for many years. I was leading a smaller ones before, but never a large one. No? So really, uh, it's been a lot of work, but also we think that we can have some impact, and, and we are very excited. Um, so let's just select that image of the chicken. I need to switch the mouse. Ah, just to click here. Yeah. Maybe now it works. Oh, yes. Uh, well, so um, probably you are aware that you are HPC, John and I think it is not an institution that is dealing with the uh, with, uh, deployment of, of large uh, infrastructures in Europe, deploying. Uh, Exascale supercomputing, Pentascale, and also already announced uh, Exascale supercomputing. And the, the issue is that these machines uh, need applications that, that kill them. <laughs> and at the same time, we have the, the presentation of the opening work was really uh, uh, on the point because what I'm going to speak is about this about the combination of HPC and artificial intelligence and data analytics and its impact in. in the scientific application and industrial application. So what, what we have is this, well, this demand from applications to be able to combine all these fields. No? And uh, I mean, this is what we, we, we have been working on. Well, this is a, a table of the current systems. Uh, you have the three on the top is the pre scale systems. Uh, two of them, uh, one, Lumia is operational in Finland, Leonardo is under construction. Finally, Maria Johnson 5 has been <laughs> have been able to, to, contract, to sign the contract or promise the tender, okay? And there are also other machines, uh, operational, for example, 
Uh, Carolina, I was collaborating with some colleagues in, in the Czech Republic on another project and we were able to use it. Okay. And uh, in, in addition, uh, there is this uh, already announced these first exascale machines in Chile uh, for, for the next uh, years. Okay. So what have been the main objectives of the project that when we designed it, uh, first uh, we wanted to deploy, the, to make available to the users a software stack for the making easier the development of workflows that integrate HPC, big data, and artificial intelligence. But it also in my group, the, coming from task-based programming models, the type of workflows that we try to enable are um, very dynamic, not only because we develop like the workflow in the past uh, at the execution time, but also because uh, we can react to like faults in the tasks, to exceptions, uh, and at the execution time we can decide that the yeah, actual workflow can, can change and explore another area of design. Okay? And, and also if we want to do workflows that are efficient both in performance and in energy. Uh, the other concept uh, that we have been working on the project is this HPC workflows as a service. It comes from the idea of functions as a service, where you can do an invocation to a, a function as a service no? and get some results and deploy and execute on, on demand. No? So the idea would be to have mechanisms to make it easier than deployment of large workflows in HPC systems, which is not uh, an easy and uh, friendly environment for uh, scientific users, for end users, and, and make it easier to, to develop, to deploy, execute these applications. No? So it's, a, it's a bit of a concept that we are working on. No? The other one is of the talk will be the, the following, and we'll speak a bit about the project architecture, the software stack. And uh, also about this new concept of the HPC workflow as a service. And I also will give you about the, the pillar applications, what are the applications that we are working in the project, okay? which are demonstrating the methodologies that we are developing. So, this is the overall uh, idea of the, of the project. No? We have in the, in the center the flows uh, for HPC software stack, no? deploying some methodologies, programming. Methods, environment, and so on, and uh, that should enable the pillar applications. We have one on, on digital twins from, for engineering, another on open workflows, and another on using computing. So, this should, this super stack should enable them to develop their workflows okay, and to uh, demonstrate the functionalities. And at the same time, we will have this HPC workflows as a service interface. Uh, that uh, should enable this easy development, uh, deployment, and execution. And also, you see in, uh, as icons uh, the logos of some centers of excellence. These centers of excellence are this other instrument in Europe uh, that uh, gives services to the user communities, right? so that from manufacturing or engineering, it's a waste in climate and cheese uh, for project computing. So, the idea is that the results of the project are also transferred to these uh, centers of excellence, they are not part of the project, okay? So if they are linked through the pillars, we want to link to these centers of excellence, no? but it's not that they are part of the, of the project. And we are also working with some uh, architectural optimizations for some bottlenecks, some kernels in the pillars, we have been identifying them, and doing specific implementations for GPUs, Accelerators and for the European process. No? And the idea is then to integrate these optimized kernels in the actual workflows to make them more uh, performant and, and more power uh, efficient. No? In terms of the infrastructure, uh, we are willing to execute in HPC. Okay? However, uh, all these concepts of uh, as a service, no? so some of the services that we have in the project cannot be deployed in HPC. No? The operations in HPC tend to be not very friendly to open connections or to hosting services that run <laughs> all the time. So that's why we are also using a cloud infrastructure as a much near infrastructure to host these services that uh, will uh, implement the services of the project. 
And, and this is a picture of the architecture of the, of the super stack. I will not go through all the details because there is a lot of things, but just that uh, there is a layer to develop the workflows, and we will see that there are like three different types of workflows that compose our workflows. No? Python is used uh, for the logic of the application. Then we have Tosca to, for, to develop the topology of the, of the workflow, how we need to deploy and execute. And then uh, the data logistics pipeline are used to describe the movements of data, which is very important. How we interconnect the data in external repositories with the computations. And then, uh, in order to build this concept of the HPC workflow services, we have some repositories, catalogs, that will be the basis to develop the workflow. So, workflow will be composed of some uh, software from the catalog, uh, some data pipelines some from the data, and, or maybe some models already, artificial intelligent models already trained that we can then integrate in a workflow. And then at the execution time, we have some, some runtime systems uh, like the Python runtime or, or the orchestrator, this is called the orchestrator. And also some data management environments to deal with the whole orchestration of the execution of the workflow. So I will go to some of these details in different slides. No? Uh, first, about the uh, most uh, software stack and HPC workflows as a service, we have uh, some uh, services that uh, we call them the pay services that are posted on, on the cloud, as I was saying. No? Um, these are then deployed outside, outside the HPC uh, computing infrastructure and are managing all the interactions of the workflow lifecycle, of the more uh, higher level workflow lifecycle. We have the HPC workflow as a service interface, uh, where we use the Android Cloud as a, as a user interface and as an execution API. The repositories and catalogs that I was mentioning. And then we have the HTML orchestrator and the data logistics service to deal with the, with, the, with the data management. And also, I will describe this image creation, which is, I think, is also quite an, an innovative uh, component. And then we have the runtime components that are deployed inside the SDC. These are the, the ones that deal with the execution of the actual uh, computation workflow. Okay? So we have like two types of workflow, one which is more the deployment and execution, the life cycle, and the other, which you can call it more the computational workflow, that is the one that runs inside the HPC, composing uh, simulations, modeling software with data analytics and artificial intelligence. Uh, how we develop, no? how we see the, the, the cycle of developing a workflow, we will have a user, a developer, that knows about the logic of the application. And can use Python uh, to develop the workflow. That has some simulations that do some, some modeling, whatever. Then the results of these simulations maybe are fit into uh, data analytics and, and do some, some filtering, some analysis of this data. And then maybe there is another uh, loop where we do some, some more simulations to generate more data, whatever. And uh, this will be that, what we call the computational workflow. But this is what we run inside the HPC. But in addition, we can have that this uh, workflow has external data, maybe some data that is staging at the beginning, some data that will stitch out at the end, or even periodical uh, stagings, or we need also the, the data logistics has to define when we need, need movements. We are using containers, no? So when we need to move images uh, to deploy inside the inside the HPC systems, it's can be also described with the data logistics by that, no? And finally, the Tosca description would be like, like the topology, no? how all these pieces are put together. The data movements, the pythons, if there are other simulations, it's, it's a more, much more uh, box level uh, workflow, okay? while the pythons is something much more uh, at a lower level, more programming levels. Okay? So once we have these different pieces, uh, pieces will be stored in the workflow registry, okay? and uh, it, it, it can make available to the end users. No? So it's published and can make it available to the end users. And then the users will be able to select one of these workflows from the workflow registry and deploy an IDK. 
Uh, I would like then to describe why it comes because it's what we've been developing in my group for, for some years now, and I always like uh, one slides about it. Okay? It comes from the area of the space programming models. No? Auto produce it also for development of workflows. Um, the idea is the same, like for example, the LMP tasks, where you have uh, tasks that are executed with the dependencies. No? So basically, it, it exploits the idea of sequential programming. But parallel execution, no? and in this case, in addition, in distributed environments. So, what, what can be a task? A task can be anything in Python because it can be some code, in this case, in Python, if it's to use the Python binding. Uh, it can be an invocation to external binary. Okay? It can be a service, it can be an invocation to a service. Okay? And then uh, we identify uh, task with this at task notation of the operator in Python. And uh, it, it's important also to give the directionality of the data. The data can be an input, can be an output, or an input. If, if an input would be that you are reading this data, an output that you are writing. And with this, at the generation time, we can generate a dance graph or workflow of the actual execution. And here, at, 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 until here, the main concept is very similar to the uh, and we are in OpenMP task, for example. But one thing that is also different is that this task internally can have more parallelism because one of these tasks can be an NTI simulation, for example, spanning with multiple nodes. Okay? Or it can be an OpenMP task inside, no? Or it can be an, in an invocation to a service. No? So I think here is where we have the difference. So each of these nodes here, in addition, can be sequential. Parallel within a node or parallel with multiple nodes. Okay? It offers also the illusion of a shared memory space. Okay? Uh, it means that if we are executing in a distributed environment, that you need to say what is your input data, but after this, uh, the runtime will deal with the required data transfers and movements. And when the task is started, the data is supposed to be available on the node or place where the task is executed. Uh, this enables also to use um, with, with large data sets because, in fact, the runtime implements a type of kind of a out of core execution where data is only uploaded in memory when it's needed. So, we have stated that it serializes this, for example, and only uploaded to memory when the task requires. Okay? So, in comparison with other programming environments, we can deal with larger data sets. Okay? And we also support persistent storage through, through some external libraries. Okay, so we can store data persistent. By say persistent storage is not only files in this, it can be in, in databases, but in a mode. Okay, so you access an object that seems to be in memory, but in fact, maybe it is residing in, in an empty RAM or a persistent storage memory. And we are using clusters, clouds, and also in containment management and these clusters. Okay. Another uh, aspect that we've been uh, extending for the for the is, it, that's, is uh, the use of constraints. No? And the constraint is a hint to a task that indicates, for example, that requires, as I said, the number of processors or not that are required, but also it can indicate that it requires an amount of memory. It supports also failures in tasks. No? A task can, if a task can fail, what I do? No? Originally, what we were doing is stopping the whole workflow, but now we can decide that you continue because I don't care, ignore that this task, task has fault. You can cancel the successors of that task, okay? or you can somehow define the, 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 the behavior. Okay? And then we have also support for screen data. No? If I have sources of streaming or stream out between tasks, uh, as, as an architecture of the environment, it deploys a master worker where the master secures the, the user code and imposes the runtime, and then it starts generating the task graphs and, and executing the task in according to the worker. The worker usually at the beginning was very simple, now every time is a bit more complex. But still, the piece of software that is a bit more complicated is, is the runtime that makes all the decisions in terms of scheduling, allocation, things like elasticity, uh, to use more resources at the execution time, all the data transfers, everything is managed by, by the runtime. 
Okay, so uh, this was uh, like a summary of Python today. Um, and then uh, now we are facing in the project this thing, no? that until now we were more focused to HPC, but now we are trying to interface with data analytics and, and artificial intelligence. No? And, and we are trying to see how we can integrate, better integrate these different type of softwares in a way that it makes it easier to the developer, no? so the user can focus on, on the actual implementation on the actual problem and don't need to think about the new code that you need to make these pieces of software to work together. Right? If you, a lot of times, if you look into a user code, uh, the actual code that is used to solve the problem is, is very small, and there is a lot of code that is needed just because it's like the intermediate steps that you need to, to make it work. No? So this is what we are trying to reduce, okay? And also trying to make all this software more reusable. No? So we have uh, these two paradigms that we are designing: the, the software integration that will be this software, no? that it, I will describe it in the next slide, and the data transformations. We've been working until now on the, uh, this concept of the software integration, and for the data transformation, we are going to work in the next in the next uh, months. Okay? So the, the idea of the data transformations is that, for example, imagine that you have an, an MPI application that runs a lot of simulations and stores the data in columns, no? But maybe then in the data analytics step that you have after, you need the data in blocks, no? And if, if, if we don't have any intermediate uh, uh, thing, the user will have to do this transformation. No? Move from columns to blocks, which is a simple change, but it still makes some program. No? So the idea is that you can define somehow with this data transformation, and that the data transformation will do this, this change for you. No? I will show uh, an application case uh, in the pillars. And so this is how we have implemented this so far, uh, so far in, in integration. Okay. So one part we have the software catalog. No? This is one of these repositories that I was telling where we have uh, things stored. No? So the idea is that the software catalog will, will have uh, instances of software that, that software that can be used in the in the workflow. No? And, and in this software description, we will have, for example, a container image, with, uh, creation instructions, no, and also some information about how to invoke this software. Okay? This can be a software, a JSON file okay, that can be given by an administrator or by an advanced user, it depends. No? Then in the Python school that is developed by, by, the, by the user, mm -hmm. but the developer, I could say, not the user, not the end user, no? uh, we will have uh, this invocation to the end software no? that we will try to keep it simple. Here, the user only needs to know that has to invoke this, this software, no? the details about how actually will be work, uh, it's in the, in the JSON, and will be automatically generated, the actual lines, actual common lines will be generated automatically at the distribution time. So this is a bit the idea. So in this way, we can convert this invocation to external complex software into a simple Python call, okay? and with this declarator, at this, using this JSON. No? And the idea is that this can be reduced, that this kind of uh, an interface that if you have another workflow that's going to use the same software, you can use the same, the same software, software description. Okay. Similarly, we have the data catalog that it's another of these repositories that will have the links to the external data sources that are used in the workflows okay. um, and provides the necessary metadata to know where the data is and so on. And then we have the data pipelines. The data pipelines is a kind of a workflow. It's also based in Python interface where the user can define the data movements that are needed. And then the data logistics service is the one that before the execution of the, of the workflow will do the data movements. Okay? And uh, it will bring data from outside to the to the to the HPC systems, and if necessary, doing the execution to more data, etc. Okay. And then we have the Tosca. No? Tosca, as I said, is more kind of box based thing. No? And we have designed uh, Tosca is the standard from the plant area, you know, it's familiar to you, but this, uh, in this, they call it extended uh, because they are moving it to be able to deploy 
in, in, in HPC. No? In this installation workflow, I, I don't know if there is a line from the image creation to it's a very thin, so I could not prove the, the line. But this would be the kind of the high level wor workflow that is executed for deployment no? and has a step of image creation, for example. I will explain what this is. And then a step of uh, doing the data movements and installation of this image. No? And then we have an execution workflow. No? This is what is executed from a very high level to start a, a computational workflow. No? That we base on the staging data, execution of a Python workflow, and then an, an stage out data. Okay? So this is what is done outside from the external HPC system to, eject, to deploy and execute a workflow. And a bit altogether, the deployment. Uh, we will have the end user, no, a user of the user community of not, not a developer, no, really a user that has some data and wants to generate the workflow. So it will select through the SPC workflows as a service, uh, a workflow to be executed from the workflows existing. No? And then we will first execute this deployment workflow. Uh, the deployment workflow will look uh, to the workflow registry, which components are needed. And for these components that are needed, Based on, on containers, we will deploy the, the HPC uh, simulators, whatever are used in the HPC system. Okay? I will explain a bit more how we do this with uh, some techniques with XML and Spark. Okay? And the other thing that we'll do uh, at, at this space is moving the data from external data sources. We will have data that is moved to the HPC related infrastructure. No? This will be the deployment. No? And how we are planning to do this, or we are doing this uh, edge containers. No? If we were using regular Docker containers, and they will not leverage the, the, the actual architecture of the supercomputers, but it would be regular uh, containers for, uh, for the given architecture without no optimization. No? So, what, what we are doing is we are uh, the, developing this collect the, the build the, the container image creation service. This box, which uh, based on a builder image, uh, builder machine using the builder's build uh, software and using uh, resize from uh, EasyBuild or Spark, will make what we call HPC ready containers. So, containers that are specific for an HPC architecture. And this would be done at the execution time, so if at the deployment time, I'll say. If we have uh, a target, uh, even architecture, an HPC architecture, and we don't have the container for this architecture, at the deployment time, we will build this image. Okay? Once it's built, we will try to reduce it. So we will store it in the container registry okay? and make it available to, the, to other users or, or other executions. No? And how we will build this, this image? It will take into account the information I was telling you in the workflow registry, for each of the steps, we will have this software information, no? the, the, the Python code, but also uh, in YAML, a description of how this image can be built. Okay? So this will be available, and the container image station will take this information, uh, and also the software description uh, here in the software catalog to build the image. Okay? And, and once image is built, uh, it will be deployed. No? In most of the systems right now, we are using Singularity because in the infrastructures that uh, we've been using in, in the project, uh, the container system that is available is Singularity. But uh, we consider that this is the concept is generic enough to be used with other other environments. Another aspect that is taken into account is uh, is, is the prevention management. Okay. So, uh, before the, the execution of the workflows, the users have also to control their, their credentials. So, so, we are using uh, a secret, secret storage okay, to manage the, the usernames, passwords, and credentials. No? And after this has been registered at deployment and execution time, the user uh, delegates uh, the authorization and all the, the security aspects. And uh, through these tokens, you know, through tokens that circulate from the secondary storage to the HPC system. So the, the executions will be secure 
garantizo this much. And then we have the, the operation on no? the actual execution. No? We can say that there were like two types of workflows, the deployment and execution. No? So once we have deployed, we can start the execution. Uh, it's also orchestrated by the, oops, the orchestrator, which first will, will move data, staging data to the HPC systems. And then we will start the Python's workflow. And here is where this Python's workflow can on one side combine HPC modeling, some simulation simulations, machine learning models, or some data analytics. And in some cases, we will have also these kernels that are optimized for some specific architectures also involved in the workflow. Okay? And eventually, we may be using uh, the data in persistent storage. Now, we have these two libraries, Puma and DataTrade, which are able to store data in persistent memory. And uh, as I said, we have this uh, cloud infrastructure, which assists uh, the, the overall infrastructure when hosting these services for deployment and distribution. Okay, so this was about the software stack, and I, I have a few more slides about the pillar application. Look how we are now uh, uh, demonstrating these pillar applications. Okay. The first one that I will explain in pillar one is on manufacturing. This is in, uh, coordinated by CIMA. CIMA is a, a lab that is also kind of a spin up of PPC in Barcelona, which we have been working in other projects and we have very good synergies. No? And they have this Kratos uh, simulator that is a finite model uh, environment that can simulate uh, with very detailed different type of things. No? And before we were working with them and simulating buildings and the impact of wind in cities and things like this. Now they are using Kratos to simulate, for example, uh, electrical engines. In this case, they want to model the cooling of a Siemens engine, which is uh, air cool. Okay? And Siemens is interested in having uh, smaller models that can be deployed by the engine okay? and using production to uh, let them know when, when, the, when the engine is, is getting to, to and I stop because it can be uh, bad for it. No? So the, the workflow in this case has an HPC part and, an, and a part that then is deployed on the on the on the final installation. No? So basically they are simulating a lot of uh, of simulation with this Kratos software with what, what they call the full order model. So these are expensive uh, simulations that generate a large matrix uh, that then Using reduce here promise reduce order model, they use reduce order model techniques to reduce this matrix into a smaller model that has uh, an expected accuracy to model the behavior, but in a smaller model that can be then deployed on a small processor in the edge no? and close to the IG. And this may require different validation uh, cycles no? because maybe at the first time we don't get and have accuracy, so maybe we need to create more full of the models and another phase of, of uh, reduction and so on until we, we get the final the final model uh, that is available. And um, an aspect that I would like to, uh, to, to describe is a bit more how we are doing this integration. So we have we have the pythons, no? as I said, that does the full orchestration of the of the of the the in this case, for example, Bacro, um, Kat, Pat, Kratos, sorry. <laughs> Kratos uh, is, is this executive task. Okay. No, it's, it's off. No, no, okay. it's okay. Yeah. Ah, it it's just trying to improve the zoom. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. It's off. Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, so this executive steps task will be the function that encapsulates uh, invocation to a simulator of, of the simulator of the simulation of Kratos. Okay? So at execution time, uh, we will call this simulation the run. And you see that here we have defined uh, this execute instance as an MPI task. No? We have this add MPI that indicates that using multiple nodes, no? multiple processes to run this instance. So, and this is combined for the reduction phase. We call a machine learning library, which is developed also on top of, of, of Python, that is called this lead, that is uh, doing this um, reduction 
this reduction step. Okay? In this case, we have the, this function RSVD that implements an, an SVD, a singular value of decomposition, to reduce the model into a smaller one. Okay? In this case, these two uh, functions are then in the same type, this would be the type of scope that involves multiple simulations of uh, the Kratos instance, and then we call once, for example, the SPD to do this trade that we took. Okay? And both of them are programmed in terms of tasks of type. Okay? So we will have some tasks that are the MPI tasks, and also here in the RSPD, although it's hidden, we have other internal tasks, because uh, this leap is implemented with tasks in, in Python. So, uh, and then also, for example, this other QR, QR task here. And uh, I want to here to explain you some problems that we have at the beginning and how we are also improving. No? This is about the data transformations that I was telling you. No? So in this case, the, all these kind of simulation generate a kind of one column or a few columns uh, for each simulation. And all these columns together and assemble into a larger uh, matrix. Okay? And they have this uh, explicit point where they have to wait for all the simulations to finish and to store them in this. Okay? And then we were getting this matrix and we were converting into blocks because this leap works with blocks in memory and running distributed mode, but also but eventually in some steps we needed to gather from distributed data into a single node and we needed uh, this red uh, bars represent like uh, a synchronization point, okay? And, and then also scatter again the data to distribute it, no? So what we have been doing, or what, and what we are trying to generalize is this fact, no? That we have been able to uh, remove this step of writing two files and we can transfer directly from the MPI simulations from memory to memory and change the data format, no? From, from columns to blocks. And, and this is implemented as a set of functions on top of Python. No? So that this would be an example of the type of data transformations that I was telling, you know, that the, the user could say, okay, simulate, do a data transformation, and then call this lead to do the RSVD, you know? but with a very simple invocation. No? And also we can be able to remove the other synchronizations that does the data movements from distributed mode to centralize and opposite, okay? Oh, no, sorry, I went too fast. Uh, so now we have the whole workflow without global synchronization. Okay? And, and if we run multiple iterations, then there are no blocking points that uh, stop the parallelism of the application. Okay? And also the, the code is similar. Okay? Uh, the other pillar is on, on climate applications. Uh, so we have, uh, in fact, two types of, of workflows. One is uh, doing a workflow of the Earth system model. And this type of workflows also usually they call a lot of uh, ensembles of simulations to predict uh, the, the evolution of the climate in this case. No? And the issue they have is that they, they use a lot of computing. But not all simulations may be useful. Sometimes some simulations during the execution they can see that they are not going to be useful. No? So that's why they, they will be using this, this AI assisted uh, union to remove, uh, to cancel some of the issues no? and reduce the number of instances that are simulated. And the other problem is, is dealing with uh, the study of tropical cyclones and implementing new AI-based uh, methodologies to do in situ analytics for the prediction of tropical cyclones. Uh, for the Earth system model, uh, they are using a simulator, the FESOM simulator, which is an MPI simulator, and as I said, they uh, manage a lot of ensemble simulations, and they are using, in this case, this Hercuba library to store partial results of the simulations in persistent storage. So even using a streaming, they want to use streaming from the FESOM simulations to the, to the storage in Hercuba. No? And then we have this other process, this dynamic analysis, that will be at the execution time analyzing uh, partial results of the simulations and decided which members of the simulations can be cancelled. Okay? And then uh, cancelling them while being executed and uh, so in, in such a way that the workflow is not stopped. Okay? This is the, one of the workflows that they are running for climate. Uh, for me, conceptually, when they described it to me, I thought that 
maybe it didn't sound that difficult, but really for the community, is is a it's very important. They told me that if they are able to do this, it will be a, a milestone on on the type of work that they can actually it really uh, has an impact on the community. And and the other use case is more based on data analysis of system databases and also predicting with with new data. No? Uh, it has three different parts: no? the, the deterministic part, which is already viable. Okay, it's, it's based on, on an algorithm that was implemented before the project, but now they are working on this machine learning version that I will describe a bit more, that is trying to predict with a, with a populational net, neural network, trying to predict the tropical cyclones. And there will be also another part of analytics that I will not describe that much. So this part of the machine learning is what I wanted to show you a bit more. Uh, so they have these three stages. So they are getting data from the Pacific uh, North, uh, historical data no? from, from the Pacific North area. And uh, they have been checking this data to train uh, the neural network. Okay? Now, each of these chunks contains uh, at least a tropical cyclone. Okay? And uh, then with this, they are now using the convolutional network to, to try to predict uh, with new data when a, a tropical cyclone can occur. And using the same network, so here the, the other network is, is here is not a new one, it's the same one that can be used when a cyclone has been detected to localize the where this uh, tropical cyclone is predicted. So they will use the same one for the two iterative predictions. Um, and then we have the third pillar on object and computing. And it has a lot of social impact, of course, because it's trying to predict uh, and have new methodologies to see the impact of a network and its uh, oncoming tsunami. Okay? And we have two different workflows, although the, the basic structure of both workflows is the same. And on the occurrence of, a, of a, an event, they start a set of example simulations, although using different software. No? So we have some uh, simulator for the earthquake and a simulator for the tsunami. In the case of the tsunami, for example, it's using GPUs and the other one is not using GPUs. Okay? And they are also developing a set of uh, data analytics and machine learning uh, tools to do the two case the event diagnosis and also to um, have models that can also be used at the same time as a simulator to predict the actual uh, the actual results, no? so instead of using only the simulation, to use also uh, training models to do the generation of data not only for the analytics. For this use case, what I wanted to highlight is uh, that for the earthquake uh, workflow, uh, our colleagues were working with a service-oriented workflow, and I wanted to to, uh, to show you how. Python can also support services. So in this case, the tasks that I was telling before that can be API invocations or whatever, they can be also invocations to services. No? So these services are deployed in a given infrastructure, and the workflow of Python still remains as a Python code with some invocations. And the difference here is that these invocations are uh, REST uh, invocations. No? And uh, eventually, uh, here is Salus invocation, for example, is, a, is an HPC code that runs in HPC. So the service in this case will spark a large or a set of large simulations in HPC. No? It's not that these only services in the cloud. Okay, okay so I'm, I'm going to finish. Okay. I don't know if I was too long or not. Yeah, on time. Okay, perfect. So what are, have been uh, the main achievements until now? Well, we have followed uh, more or less traditional roadmap in this type of projects. We did the first phase of uh, discussing with the pillars and the software providers about the requirements. And, and with this, we defined the first version of the software architecture. And also, we defined uh, what was needed for this uh, integration, what, how we could do the HPC workflows as a service interface, and so on. And, and then we define this first version of the software integration paradigm okay, and, of, and also uh, the integration of the different software components. And we've been working with what we call a uh, minimal workflow. Okay, uh, that it's minimal in the sense that it's uh, relatively small, but has all the components that has allowed us to identify 
uh, which aspects needs to be in, in the software part, which components, which different group both, etc. Uh, we have done a first uh, design and implementation of the software stack and also of the HPC workflows as a service. And it's available in GitHub, it's publicly available. Not all projects is doing this, as I learned a couple of weeks ago. So I think it's good that this early. And also, we have documentation, uh, some online documentation with the uh, talks. And, and we have the first version of the pillars um, almost finished because it's new in August, but most of them is very advanced. Uh, specifically, the pillar one that I showed this for uh, workflow without synchronizations is, is uh, already has a first version uh, end to end of the end to end workflow that is running uh, with, with all the, with all the software integrated. As I told you, in this case, uh, they were already working with us before, so we, they were more familiar with Python and then they went they were faster on the developments. Um, we have done also a first, uh, first set of internal trainings, and now we are opening to external trainers. They, they will be uh, a training in September that will be public. If anybody is interested, I, I can send invitations. And we will have a hackathon also, although at the end, uh, the hackathon will be internal, but uh, I, in the second phase of the project, we are planning some workshops and external trainings uh, to, to do this technology transfer to the communities. So the idea will be to do some uh, workshops with uh, centers of excellence and, and specific communities that have shown interest. For example, the SKA community invited me to give a talk on one of the workshops. And, and they show a lot of interest on, on being invited to one of these one of these uh, workshops. And uh, I think we have had good visibility also. Thanks also because some nice people invited me to give keynotes. <laughs> and, uh, so we are happy with the actual visibility of, of that project. Okay. okay. So to conclude, uh, uh, we, we think that there is this need not to provide. Uh, development tools because uh, SPC systems are not easy to use. No? And when, at the beginning of the project, when we were speaking to some of our users, telling them, no, we want to do this automatic deployment. They look at us like crazy. We want to do this automatically. It takes me sometimes two months to have our software installed in an SPC system. I said, well, we will try. <laughs> uh, so, but and also the development tools no? that make it easier, uh, the, the development. And on the deployment of the applications. Okay. So, we aim at providing this software task uh, start, and probably it's not going to be a standard because uh, workflows, the problem with workflows is that every community has their own environment. There are like hundreds of them, hundreds was the last number I heard, <laughs> three, four, four, hundred. Okay, even more. Uh, so it's very difficult, uh, but well, we are working also in the community, like in the workforce uh, community initiative that is led by Rafael Silva in the States, trying to, to have some impact in the community of, of workflow. And in general, we I think this HPC workflows as a service idea is quite a, a bit uh, different. I think I have some impact, and right after after now it has shown to be interesting to, to the community. And this is the, all the project partners. We have a combination of supercomputing centers. Uh, we have uh, industry with Siemens and Antitop and also Atos. Okay? And uh, of course, we have a lot of academics and academics from different areas, no? more from the world of workflow or IT and PC area. And then a lot of uh, scientifics, but more from the climate, from uh, from the uh, tsunamis and so on. And so it takes a lot. Sorry if I take too long. <laughs> Thank you for a very engaging talk. Uh, are there any questions from the audience for our speaker? Yes, please. Uh, the microphone can hear you, so you just. Well, I, can, I can talk loud. Yeah, this is perfect. Thank you. It's an excellent presentation. Thank so, you. I was thinking you touched upon a little bit uh, on the security side. So, scientific workflow is coming, right? It, as you say, that we span, will span from Asia to center, probably will involve multiple organizations, multiple administrative domains. 
and as you know, working in this externalization is very difficult, right? Every uh, domain has their own security standard. You go to US National Lab, they use one type of things. You go to the university, they have others. So, have you given a thought about this disparate security requirement? And also, depending on the data and execute, some data not that sensitive, so you have differential privacy. So, United States uh, Department of Energy has taken an initiative to the committee to look into this. That when we go from age to center, it's, uh, their security models are different, the requirements are different. And you know, you work with two administrations, one will say something, one requirement, and how do you match those? And it's a difficult challenge. But you guys, when you are putting this together, making it easier is excellent, right? The scientist needs to do science, not worry about the HPC yeah. or environment. But have you, uh, uh, in Europe, have you guys are thinking and thinking about it? Well, nothing has been done in the US. Just put together a committee, find out the requirement. Why do we want to invest in the next 10 years? That's I'm part of the committee. So we are just pulling our hair out that what to do. Are you guys doing anything well, about that? What we did in, in for this security and practices, not only in security, but the practices in in, uh, in containers and other aspects that we needed for the project was to circulate with the different HPC uh, centers uh, questionnaire asking them about all these aspects. So we get from this we get what we call the HPC centers requirements. No? And, and with this then we designed this. Uh, it's only a, it's not security. I would say it's only authorization and authentication. We didn't feel that much with the security in the project. But in principle, for the HPC centers that after until now we have been looking at, uh, we apply to their uh, practices. No? We are now expanding because um, we started these uh, questionnaires with the centers that are involved, like TURI, PSC, uh, CMCC, uh, I think it was another postman. But now we are extending to other centers that are not are in Europe but not in, in our project. I think. Uh, CSC, one hosting in Lumi, Chineca, and uh, we ask the rest. We so are asking to others to have a broad and, and then if there are other requirements, uh, we do try to adjust. The name is a good idea if you have contacts uh, in the States or, or outside to send to circulate this uh, questionnaire and to see uh, if there would be much different. I thought that for the questionnaires in Europe, was not that different. It was more or less. More generous, but maybe you are wrong, and, and the practices are very different. Then on, on the security part, in this project we are not doing that much, but in, in other projects that I'm involved that are more edge to cloud or edge to HPC, uh, what we are using is, is techniques to, to encrypt the containers, for example. Um, at TOD, there is one software, for example, that does this, it's able to the encryption of the containers and all the data and everything, so you can have security at this level. But I'm not an expert on security. No, <laughs> so me neither. I'm just thinking that are there any initiative because you know, in no, different no, organizations, no. it will be different. People will think differently. What are the requirements? Why are it is going? We have to deal with it at some point of time. We are even that you are removing the data from here. Before. Requirement is here with that. We're looking at the governance. There's one requirement here, different requirement. So, is there any initiative that? No, I'm looking no, at no, no, no. it. There are some fundamental challenges. How do you describe things that would be able to get that? Not, not, uh, we are not dealing with them, and I don't know, I don't know uh, any specific. But I would like to probably uh, go here to our, uh, to our with okay. a researcher hat and Professor Schwede because. This is uh, definitely something that the uh, health uh, care providers, researchers, and clinicians have to deal with. And we have such an issue in Switzerland. Maybe there are other initiatives in other countries for sure. But federated at the EU level, it's even more complicated. But I think we have to learn from those communities how to share data without sharing uh, the sensitive part of it. So maybe you have a comment uh, on that. I can only talk from so. I can only talk from our community, so you might want to touch on the next year, which is a European mm -hmm. infrastructure for data exchange in the life sciences. And same for global alliance for genomics and health. 
they both have tried to come up with at least authentication authorization mechanisms that work in your cross country cross institution. On the one layer down, on an atomistic access control level for the data, we're also struggling. There hasn't been a good model yet. And that's why I mentioned the, the privacy preserving computational techniques before, because it overcomes a lot of the problems we, we haven't been able to address yet. But you might want to look at, at these two projects. Thank you. If there are other questions, we have more time. Yes, uh, there was one in the back, and then there was one in the front. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for a very interesting keynote. Thank you. And when you showed us the, the initial workflows of your Villa applications, and they contain a lot of different, um, I would say, third party applications. So, like, for instance, schism, simulations, Cassandra, and so on. So, I guess that most of these systems are not aware of your own control, but they are third party applications. Only. And um, so I'm wondering, um, was there anything special they had to do to uh, integrate those applications to connect with them, um, to ensure an additional data transfer with them, for instance? Uh, so do you have to each of these different applications uh, separately in some way, or is, do you have some general means of uh, integrating any insert party application? Okay. It's right. Eh? Actually, this is uh, the goal that we want to, to tackle. Okay. So our idea is uh, let me put uh, these pictures. Uh, this one. So the idea is that we will have this software catalog that will host uh, each of the different HPC softwares and other also AI, whatever. So of course that are available for the work from the developers. And the idea is that we this uh, software description is kind of metadata that describes uh, how to build the, the, the container for this uh, specific software. And this other same JSON will be how to involve it. You know? How you can as an end user, how you will call this, this software you know, with a common line. So the idea is that with these two pieces we have the information on how to install the software and the information of how the software has to be called. And the idea is that then the Python scope will be kind of a, a similar interface that we offer to the user. No? And the user don't need to deal with the actual uh, invocation details. Okay? This can be reflected in the JSON and through the Python then automatically will be generated the actual invocation. This is the idea we have. No? So, so the same way that you have there the invocation JSON installation description, you will have one of these boxes for Fesom, you will have one of these boxes for Kratos, another for the, the uh, IC software, that is one of, of the Tsunami, and so on. And, and in the Python school, the user will use similar to this one, no? defined as a, as a method in Python that passes some parameters and then the actual JSON, no? that is it's like the receipt of how things work. And the other part is the description of the, how to install uh, the, the, the system no? with the, the, the result of the container no? based on uh, uh, easy build or Spark. No? Here we will have, right now we are using more Spark because with easy build we have some, some issues. Um, so, with this information, is the idea that we have to integrate all these different softwares. I don't know if I answer better now. Yeah, that's, that's a perfectly answered answer the question. Thank you very much. There was another question here. Oh, thank you very much. 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 Thank you for example, the work in the case of scientific workflow, I know that we know that it's very easy to, to know the structure to predict like what make a simulation, Monte Carlo, and so on. But for example, in satellite image processing, especially for the natural disaster, it's possible to have unpredictable structure of workflows or maybe cycle execution of uh, of several components in the workflow. Mm -hmm. Do you know some experience related to scheduling or something like that? Well, the, the, the nice thing of, 
Thank you, Polly. Uh, the, the nice thing of, of, uh, well, this, of course, for me is very nice. But the nice thing of Python is that even that you can use a programming language to describe the behavior of the of the workflow. The flexibility that you have is 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 very high because if your uh, predictable behavior can be described in the form of an algorithm, I can have the workflow that implements this behavior. So the, our idea is this: that you use the Python in this case to describe the behavior of the workflow, no? yeah. and, and you can have while loops, conditional loops. In addition, we have these exceptions and fault yeah. tolerance and so on. And so, so this is our idea. No? That for us, a, a workflow is not like a set of boxes that are from the beginning and can, I can draw it and and that's all. No, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a description in the form of a, on a and you can implement. Any type of, can be an, an optimistic algo. These uh, people, Kratos, were working on uh, were working with them in a workflow. I know the project, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Multilevel Monte Carlo. And Multilevel Monte Carlo has also conditions and, and rules and so yeah. on. No? So you had the Multilevel Monte Carlo uh, library that internally was parallelized with Python. No? So it, it has these two views no? the, from the level of the, of the Workflow designer can have in the mind the behavior of the of the workflow and can describe it with Python, with Python, no? yeah. and then it's parallelized with with the runtime. Did I, I, I answer? Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I can just follow up on this one. So I was wondering if the system captures runtime behavior of the various applications. Because what, what we realize in my field is that a lot of workflows they go from trivial to impossible, and that just depends more on the parameter settings. And it's very often for user hard to figure out in the beginning like how the application will behave. But imagine if this becomes application as a service, there's, there's a challenge to be predictable in the sense of can I expect the result by when? Is there in any way the, the system tries to, to capture that and to make a precast or do you mean like predict the, the execution time or predict execution time, complexity on what, what systems well, do I need to be efficient? We are not doing that much of monitoring in this project, but in other projects we are doing this, trying to monitor uh, the execution time and train a sort of model that given at previous executions of the workflow kind of predict the time that the workflow can take. Uh, the other thing that you can have is the time constraint. So an, an, an alternative to this, some we have also the users from my uh, uh, yeah, like, 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 so. Uh, so sometimes what they tell us is well, you know, in my workflow, I'm calling 100 times this simulation no, with different parameters. But if it's taking more than 50 minutes, just cancel it. No? So but then you can put a, a, a timeout. And add to that task and cancel it in case it's taking longer. So, the environment right now is not giving this prediction, but as I said, if it can be an external monitor, that's what that helps. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs>